But I can still remember those times when whiskey drinks came without limes and no one cared about calories in beer. Now there's skinny jeans and hair salons and football hits are frowned upon. Tobacco is a bad curse, but not carrying a man purse. I can remember days gone by when blue jeans had no button fly and men were men and full of pride before the manhood died. So bye bye to the American guy. Trade your Chevy for a Prius. Change your white bread to rye. Those hunting rifles are illegal to buy, and now everyone gets trophies who try. 'Cause keeping score might make someone cry. Now pedicures and latte blends have replaced playing poker with your friends. That's not how it used to be. And for many years, Old Spice held the throne, and now it's Justin Bieber alone. And women weren't in the combat zone. I'm afraid that manhood has died. So we keep singing bye bye to the American guy. Trash your old zipper Levi's and get some button flies. Take your truck and SUV and just kiss them goodbye. Singing this will be the day manhood died. This will be the day manhood died. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to the round table. Tonight's roundtable will be hosted by Doug Force. Doug, do you want to take it away, please? Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Ed. Ed's our moderator, uh, moderator for tonight, and uh, he's going to do another wonderful job, as he's done for us in the past, and will probably continue to do us for the future. Uh, tonight, uh, joining us on the roundtable, I have uh, Brenda Statner coming in from So Saskatchewan. Um, we have uh, John Mahalch uh, from... The Alberta Constitutional Committee organization, along with Cody Holler and Neil Maguda. And that makes up our panel for this evening. Uh, Mr. Rolf Hartwell was supposed to be here tonight, but he took a nasty slip and fall on the ice uh, earlier today and was unable to make it. So here we are tonight. And uh, I'll get it all started. Tonight we're going to, well, the name of it is Constitutionals. Huh? What are they? How do we write one? So I thought I would start off with a little information about what is a constitution and, uh, and how are they structured? And so first of all, what is a constitution? And the simplest answer to that question is it's a contract. And it's a contract between we the people and the government that we create to protect our unalienable rights. It's that simple, but it's also one of the most difficult documents that to write. I mean, it takes the will of everybody. <clears throat> I'm not talking two or three people. I'm, I'm, if you're in Alberta, there's 4 million people. Participation in the creation of a constitution is absolutely something everybody should be involved in doing. Even if you don't think you know anything about it, doesn't matter. Your voice needs to be heard. You have a seat at the table. Exercise your rights. So, architectural design. In other words, how is a constitution created? Through an architectural design or a blueprint. What does that mean exactly? Well, it means you're going to have to set the jurisdictions of law that will be created under this constitution and what type of government you're looking to create, whether it be a democracy or a direct democracy, a, a republic, a democratic republic, a communist regime, a fascist regime. Um, 
doesn't matter. It still has to be stated within the architectural design and that will be the design of the government. So the clauses that create that government will be part of the architectural design and then the jurisdiction of law, laws, I should say, plural, is what they will be able to work within to protect your own illegal rights. So I'm actually gonna pull Ed right now. I just wanna give you a quick example from the US Constitution. If Ed could put the US Constitution um, up on screen that I sent him earlier today, I wanna to show you a little something about jurisdiction of law. Ed? Thank you. Or maybe not. <laughs> There we go. Nope. First one, Ed, not the second one. That's the second one. Keep that one available because I'll be going that to that one next. Now, the reason I want I want to bring this to people's attention is because this is what I'm about to show you is the problem that happened in the United States. Um, nope, that's still the second one, Ed. Um, the problem that happened in the United States, uh, Abraham Lincoln, in 1861, uh, when the southern states abandoned the Congress, um, he ended Congress signed I, or without day. <clears throat> and over time, there we go, over time, they actually killed him, uh, but they maintained Congress without day, and it's, and it's still to that way today. And if we look at this, this is section two from uh, the article three of the, uh, and it gives the jurisdictions of law and it's all in one clause. So it says the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity, which means common law, arising under the constitution, the laws of the United States treaties made or which shall be made under the authority to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. So that means that their courts can operate admiralty, maritime, common law, or equity, which is a mistake. And as I was saying, they ended Congress signed I. So in 1871, they created the Second District of Columbia Act uh, and tried to reseat the government in maritime jurisdiction. It failed to take any effect simply because the um, DOC. Uh, act that was created in 1871 had to be repealed in 1874, but they were successful when they did it again in 1878, and they actually moved the government from constitutional common law to a maritime jurisdiction, and they were able to do it simply because of this clause. They didn't create separate courts for each jurisdiction of law. And now if we can go to the next panel, Ed, I'm going to show you. This is this. These are. Uh, it, it's titled "Some Jurisdictions of Law," which means that I haven't included everything there. Now, the reason I I've, I've done this is so that you can see. So there's common law, there's equity, there's maritime, and if we could scroll down a little bit further, Ed, you'll come across. Admiralty jurisdiction, and then finally civil law. Now I put civil law in there for a reason, and I've highlighted the word countries there, and I want you to see the next highlight that has that is Quebec. So they actually agree, stop there, Ed, that's fine. So they, when they say countries, and then they say what jurisdictions of law, they talk about a country of Quebec. Isn't that interesting? Um, I got that off of uh, Wiki this afternoon, just as an example of the, the different types of laws that you can have coming into your constitution. And the idea is to create, if you're going to have maritime law, then you'll have maritime law with maritime courts. 
and they will be very specific that they will be on the waterways and 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 the lakes if you're in saskatchewan it'll be the lakes and the rivers very specifically designed for the water if you're going to have common law you're going to have common law which is law of the land and it will have a you'll have common law courts for that and they will be your criminal courts then you'll have your equity and civil matters courts which will be a separate court where you go in and you can sue a corporation or a corporation could sue you and then if you decide to have a military then you'll have military courts or tribunals under admiralty jurisdiction or you could throw it all and say look we're just going to do this under civil law and we're going to take if you scroll to the very bottom of the page there ed there's what they call the no the, the no oh god <laughs> now i'm having there we go napoleonic code and it talks of law of persons property law and commercial law so under the napoleonic code you would codify all your laws within that and the problem that you have with the napoleonic code is that you're dealing with persons and not men and women but you can it, it, it's not up to me to tell you what to do it's up to the will of the people as to what they want to have done so now with that being shown we we'll go back to our people here. Um, I know that Brenda has brought on uh, a little something from her, uh, the, the a link to uh, once that they're working on a clauses for constitution in Saskatchewan. I know that Neil has similarly done the same thing for Alberta. And I know that they're gonna be able to show you what they're talking about here. And I, I just wanted to lay this foundation as we go into this, because what now we're going to talk about is not so much structure of the Constitution, but what the will of the people will want to see within that Constitution. So I'm just going to hand the floor over to both Brenda, if she wants to start, or Neil, if he wants to start, with their links. And I'll mute my microphone. Hi there. Um, I don't know if you have the link there, Ed. Um... I, I basically came up with this this idea that Saskatchewan is is um, a lot of country, and how do I um, how do I help people feel that they they're being involved? And so I decided, well, you know, Iceland did this crowdsource thing, and I just took a spin off of that and started a document. I basically started it with um, just a preamble. It was a generic preamble. And um, people just started adding as, as I added people to the link. The document has grown. It went from like one paragraph to I think there's about seven or eight pages in it now. And it's not me writing it. It's everybody that has a thought, has a question. Um, opposing opinions is really important it's a place to start a start place to create dialogue and to um basically get the conversation going so that we can have this this done we all know we need one it's just where do you start and so that's what i i did i just gave it a start spot um and as we grow knowing things, or as our knowledge base grows, so does the document. And every time somebody um, does a live feed and, and mentions, hey, you know, like this, we need to address this. All of a sudden there it appears in the document, you know, not even three days later. So um, people are working on it and it's great. It's what an experience to watch this thing grow. That's about all I have to say. Um, I think I helped Neil. How's yours going now, Neil? Uh, I'm still working on parts of it. Uh, yeah. Not a lot of people are putting too much in. Uh, it is close to the Christmas season. Oh, so sure. I'm going to work on some more things to draw people to it so they can put what they want to put in. I haven't had a look at yours. Does yours have headings as to where they can put things? Uh, that's what I'm still working on. I'm working on part okay. of it today. 
Right. It's just try to balance it, do this, and run around the house, cleaning the house, stuff like that. <laughs> There's no, no I hear you. No I excuse. hear you. I hear you. Um, even even with the headings, they can be changed and they they can be subheaded, and it it was just a, a place to start organizing. That's that's basically what it is. It's a, a place to organize and and have people organize. And it's a great teaching tool, if I may interject here, for both uh, of your because of what you're doing, both Neil. Uh, and John and, and Cody will be doing their constitutional committee meetings, but you've already started them. Um, and it's a great teaching tool that you bring to those meetings for people to participate when they go home um, and, and understand that, you know, what they're doing is it's not, they're not writing a constitution, but they're learning to write a constitution. That's which right. is hugely differential from writing one specifically so there should be no fear whatsoever for the people to add change subtract or what have you what goes into this because it is a teaching and a learning tool for all of you guys out there can i have at least a little input from john and cody maybe a little bit please <laughs> What was really interesting was your your um, descriptions of the uh, jurisdictions of law, and um, I had a lot of people ask me about law jurisdiction, and and I, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not up on the law like a lot of people, but I basically described jurisdiction the same thing as a Walmart superstore kind of thing where you've got clothing in one area and you've got um, food in the other and you're not going to go into the grocery department to get a, a fur coat. So it, and people think a court of law is just that, a court of law, it addresses everything. And that's some the problem. People, some people. But that's that's the problem today in Canada. A court of law does address everything because it's not law at all. It's color of law. It's right. fake. It's pretend law. Those are administrative offices for the corporation that they pretend to be courtrooms when they're not. Right. When we when we seat de jour in the in the various countries known as Canada here, when we seat de jour, you will if you have a problem with another person, let's say you have a problem with your neighbor you'll go to your equity or civil court to, to, call it, to find solution. But if you have uh, some guy beats the hell out of your um, son, well, he will go and he'll be charged with uh, a criminal. He'll go into the common law court where he will be um, subject to uh, law of the, of the common law or criminal law. And likewise, if you have a boat on the water and you have an accident and you run into a canoe, let's say, um, the matter would be so, uh, uh, sorted in a maritime jurisdictional court where they will have a set. And I can't stress this enough, that you need to make sure that you have those separate courts in separate clauses within the Constitution. Um, and otherwise, you're opening the door as the Americans, the founding fathers, who actually believed in that men would be trustworthy and stand up kind of guys and they wouldn't cross these lines boy were they wrong because that's what happened they saw an opportunity with uh, with um lincoln leaving congress open or, or without without closing congress he left it sign die which means without day and by the way if when they close congress it's called de jour or with day isn't that interesting uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, that's where that comes from now. Yeah. So, yeah. but they can't close Congress today. Um, Ed and I had a brief conversation about this uh, earlier today. Um, and I said, because if they, if they actually end Congress or, or give it day, the 535 members of government would be immediately arrested and, and tried on for treason uh, wow. because of their actions over the past. Well, even 
you get Nancy Pelosi, who's been there for what, 30 years. She's been committing treason against we the people for over 30 years. Even Donald Trump would be would be tried uh, and held accountable for treason, and he's only been there two years. Uh, AOC would wind up the same way. Um, the, and that's because they're actually not, it, Trump is, is responsible for not allowing Congress to close. Nancy Pelosi is supposed to close Congress. That's her job as Speaker of the House. At the, at the end of every Congress, she's supposed to stand and close Congress de jour. She does not. She ends it, sign, die, the same way Abraham Lincoln did. So there's all these little trickies that people don't see. Only you're going to learn from history. And those who fail to learn from history will repeat themselves, or will have history repeat itself. And so that's why I'm this kind of this big proponent on teaching people what happened. This is what happened. Please learn what happened. So, so then so you we can, don't so we don't put it in. <laughs> so we don't make the same mistakes. Exactly. And and we're in such a wonderful position, all of us, all of us here in this wonderful position to fix what should have been done in 1931. Yes. Well, actually, we shouldn't, in, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, we shouldn't even be here. <laughs> True enough. True enough. 1905. Yeah. They, they didn't even use the British North American Act 1867. They tried to fool you all by yeah. bringing you in under the 19, uh, 1871 Act. Which was the which was the one that they created for the province of Manitoba, so that they could they could literally because don't forget the British North American Act as letters patent only went to the Governor General. So the British Parliament created these the 1871 Act to go actually out to the Manitoba Parliament so that they could distribute it to the people to show that the Governor General had the right under 146 to bring Manitoba in as a province. Oh, so they ushered us in under that one. Yeah, they tricked they, because they knew that in, 18, in January 22nd, 1901, that the 1870, 60, 1867 Act died with Queen Victoria. Uh, oh, but if you, read, if you read Section 109, that's why they do it. That's Section 109 gives them the authority over your resources. Yes, I read that. I wasn't happy about it. And this is the whole idea of when you constitute your own authority, these type of clauses will go into your constitution. As we, we did a Skype call last night, ladies and gentlemen, just to kick the soccer ball around with each other. And we were talking about the various types of clauses that we would look at putting in to cover things like um, taxation, um, Family court, I believe, was was brought up here as well. Um, pensions, et cetera, et cetera. And how would they be taken care of? Uh, you know, I'm, and so if you look at the resources, and I think, wasn't it you, Neil, that talked about how much Suncor was paying in taxes to the government? Was it yeah, 660? $660 million, was it a year in taxes, they actually had to pay the federal government. This money could have stayed in the province and been there for we the people. There's no reason on God's little green planet here that anybody should be poor, that anybody should be homeless, that anybody should be without food. You know, it's, this is ridiculous. And well, you've heard me trump on about this before. <laughs> Let somebody else trump on about it. Yeah, I, I agree, Doug. There's there's really no reason for that, especially with the technological capabilities and the resources we have at our disposal. Um, one of the biggest questions I have, I guess I'm going to direct this towards Brenda. Um, you have this open source uh, constitution in the works, yet we have a whole bunch of people that aren't thoroughly educated, even you said yourself, as to the jurisdictions of law. So when you have people taking stuff in and out and and whatnot you have we have the potential obviously for it to revert back to the same type of um, vulnerabilities correct so do do we think it, it should be pertinent to make parts that are potentially 
unchangeable or fixed temporarily with education as to why those certain sections are fixed as basically a structure or something like that and be able to work from there for the changes or, or what, you know, what, what are we, what's the goal? Oh, here? Well, with, with the open document, you mean uh, people writing in and taking out before th that isn't the constitution. Um, yeah. Those things need to be discussed at community level and then they write their own um, constitutions or they come back and they add more to the, the, the document itself. But no, it, it was only started as a start spot to, to get it going. Because okay. people are saying, we're asking me, well, what are you guys doing? And I'm saying, well, I've done this and I've done this and, the, and there's no proof. So the document itself provided them a framework saying, yeah, um, we are getting organized. We are doing something and we can get on board with this. And they know in itself, it's a great big heading saying, this is not, this has to be discussed before a clause can be made. And so then when we go, when we do the um, meetings, um, the informational meetings, that's when we discuss certain aspects of it. It's, it's too much to discuss all in one meeting. But I mean, that's where we, that's where we start. Okay, law jurisdiction or how are we going to deal with the resources or how are we going to limit the government so that it um, doesn't become a dictatorship like what we have now? You know, how, are, how are, can we do things? And so it's sort of like the difference between civil rights and civil liberties, right? You may, you may if I may interject, um, you may, yep. taking from Cody's um, um, observation here, you may want to, um, put in half a dozen jurisdictions of law that people can look at. Also, it, it gives them an opportunity to, to say, oh, I don't know what civil law jurisdiction is. I can go on the internet and I can look it up. Or I don't know what equity law jurisdiction is. I'll go on the internet and look that up. So it gives them some stepping off a point. I usually, what I do too when I go to the meetings is I, I print off... Um, <clears throat> links to to websites where they can um go and and um look at the things that we were discussing too so that's another thing that you can do when you have your meetings is is um show where you're getting your information from right absolutely so, you have to show where you're getting your information from <laughs> Well, it, it's, you don't have to, but it, it gives people a, a chance to go back and, and actually um, take a look and, and learn and understand. Because lots of times in a meeting, you, you discuss a hundred different things. So here's, here's four links to go back and take a look at as a reference point. That's, that's something else I do. Anyway, that's, there's, um, so the document itself, is there anything going to be lost on it? No, I do a save every every month. Um, and as it grows, probably I'll have to do it once a day rather than once a month. But um, for now, once a week, maybe we'll, it'll go into. And that way, if somebody does remove something, um, there's still a reference point to have it because I do save them. So it, it just creates another document. Eventually I'll have to clean it up, but right now I've got room. Yeah. I think one of the, the biggest concerns I have is uh, uh, a lot of people aren't aware of what has happened and how we've lost our, our freedoms and our rights and aren't even aware that it has occurred or the mechanisms by which that was accomplished. And uh, I think that uh, moving forward, it's going to be really pertinent that we educate people as to the reality of what's happened. And I know that the Mythos Canada has a, a great deal of resources in that aspect. Um, but I also think that it's important and imperative that we teach people what, what those rights are and why they're so important 
how they can be abridged and how they can be protected. Well, one of the things that I noticed when I was um, at uh, the last couple of meetings for Brenda, what she um, was, was um, bringing to their attention was this beautiful document called the Declaration of Independence. And that really kind of the way that that document was created by um, Mr. Jefferson, it really emphasizes on your unalienable rights and what they are and how and then, the, then, then the discussion within the group starts to talk about, oh my God, you know, the creator gave us rights, they're unalienable rights. And, and it's very important that we understand that. And that's a really good stepping off point for yourself, Cody, uh, John, Neil, when you're doing these kinds of constitutional committee meetings. And the myth is Canada teaches you the history of what happened in Canada. But there's so much uh, stuff out there that you can access. The Declaration of Independence, for example, is a great one for, for opening the door and talking about unalienable rights and what they are and how you maintain them and how you would structure the government to maintain them. Um, there are all kinds of other stuff available for you as well that, that you can use as teaching tools for the people that you're going to be standing in front of. John, you got this, or do you want me to jump in? <laughs> That's why I stopped. Go for it. Well, you sent me uh, that information for alienable rights, and I'm trying to get through some of it. I got a lot of stuff to get reread and catch up on. But that's where would you help me when I did this draft? I put it in there. And I still got to get it, John's email properly. I got to get Cody. I'm going to send a copy of it to you guys so you guys can read it over. I don't know if John read it yet or not. Yes, I did. And I think that it's a, a wonderful foundation, <clears throat> a good start. Um, the fact of the matter is we've got to start somewhere. And by saying that, the same goes out for why we're out doing these constitutional convention committees, getting out there and educating people, because so many people know so little about so much. And before Christmas of last year, I didn't know much either. And if I learn this information, you can learn it too. It's that simple. Um, we got to get out, and it's just got to be explained in a way that people understand, right? Um, there's different grades of learning at this stuff and believe you me, it's an abundance of information um, Back to the constitutions. Well, yes, we we aren't writing a constitution What we are suggesting are clauses for the constitution. There is another process that needs to happen <clears throat> In order for us to be able to actually write the constitution right now. It's awareness. We need to get out We need to meet people make people aware and let them know that you and I and everybody in this room and everyone at home watching this, you guys all have a say in this too, you know? So while we're going to be coming to your community soon, I'm in Alberta. Uh, we've got our next meeting is scheduled for January 12th at the Sands Hotel in Edmonton, 12340 Fort Road in the JC's Diner. Uh, wonderful lady, uh, got some space there, seats, we could probably get 50 to 100 in there, no problem. Uh, we don't know what to expect. Uh, this is our first one. It's taken a while for us to kind of get off the ground and running. Because, of course, like most of you people in here, we're also living paycheck to paycheck. I'm wondering how we're going to pay our bills and, and when are we going to be at the tipping point that we're going to fall off this cliff as well. But rest assured, we're going to go down swinging and we're going to do as much as we can. And our objective in teaching all you people this is to create teachers as well. We need more leaders. We need more people in more communities. The only way this is going to happen is if we all unite and start getting on a common goal. It doesn't matter what your beliefs are. It doesn't matter. Put all your stuff aside. Unite. Start to move forward. Start to educate. We've got to educate the masses here. We've got to get out. We need people all over Alberta. 
many people down in Lethbridge, Calgary, Red Deer, you know, perhaps we should start zoning Alberta so that we can get reps everywhere and we can get out and start getting it to happen because <clears throat> um, we're running out of time. People are, people are losing big time. You know, I brought it up on other feeds before Christmas, right around the corner. Where are you spending your money? A Walmart? Are you going to go and try and find some sort of local supplier? We, we really got to be more conscious on what we're doing with our money in this country, right? And spending it in the right places. And personally, I'd much rather support local or Canadian, for that matter, uh, of a product than getting something from China. I mean, just because it's cheap doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Yes, it may cost you a little extra, but you're feeding another Canadian family by doing so, right? Just something to keep in mind. I mean, you won't see me at Walmart this year. I think they've made enough money, and I'm sure most of you could probably agree, right? There's uh, Amazon. Hey, yeah, there's another good one. Ordering online. Sure, it's great, but now you're into the credit card racket where you're paying 21 percent or whatever you manage to get out of these crooks <laughs> so you're paying for this until summertime and then it's summertime well then you gotta go camping and beer so now the credit card comes out again and man when does it end aren't you guys sick of living paycheck to paycheck just getting out of debt to get back into debt to get out of debt and it's just this revolving circle that keeps happening i mean maybe we need a camper's village maybe that's how we can start saving money but we've certainly got to try and do something because the path that we're on is detrimental to all of us especially our kids <clears throat> what are we going to do for them right if you can't make a decision to do this for yourself with you being a human being the person then think about your kids. And if you don't have kids, that's fine too. Because your neighbor has kids. You've got cousins. You've got nieces. You've got nephews. Everybody's got something. And that's what we've got to start focusing towards is the bigger picture here. Because uh, things are crazy. When you start learning what we're offering for education with the Mythos Canon and what has actually happened through history... And then you start doing a bunch more research on things that are happening every day. And all the dots start to connect for you. You're going to change your views on, you know, where you're spending your money. And exactly what you're going to be doing to, to move forward. Um, yeah, Nikki Hurley, you're right. We do have to support each other. Remember that back in the day when you used to be able to go to your neighbors for a cup of sugar or an egg? When I go to your neighbors, and if you don't know them, they might answer it with a shotgun. What's society come to, you know? <clears throat> it's ridiculous. Your kids can't even play outside anymore. Uh, pedophilia rings. and I mean, when when does it end? It's, it's ridiculous. So all the more reason that all of us got to get together, start educating people, start uniting. We all know that we need something way better than what we have. Um, I've also got a Discord server up, everyone, and uh, we're on MeWe as well, the Myth is Canada. Please come join so you can find out what's happening in your country, Alberta, Saskatchewan. That's all we have there for now. So we can, uh, we got to start keeping in touch. Facebook's a wash, YouTube's gone. It, it's a spiral effect that's happening. And uh, at these events, I'd like to start recording names, emails, and phone numbers because we're getting wiped out. And before long, we're not going to have any form of communication because <laughs> they, don't want, they don't want the truth exposed. So I suppose the big question is, what do you want to do with it? Something to think about. Well, and... and uh, just to interject here, I've been um, been speaking to some people uh, with one particular gentleman out in Vancouver. Uh, because it's Christmas time, I'll be um, getting more involved with him. He wants to start doing constitutional committee meetings in Vancouver, and I'm going to have him contact uh, you, John, uh, Cody, uh, Neil, and um, contact Brenda. I look at you guys as the cornerstone of 
the creation of these constitutional committee meetings. And uh, I think that you can be great help to not just the people of your own country, but people of the other countries as well that need an assistance to get going on this. Um, I've been working with Duke Willis here in Ontario. There's a couple of people from Northern Ontario that have reached out to us. Duke is working with the gentleman from Southern Ontario and seems to be starting to make some roads here in Ontario. Um, regrettably, we haven't had a lot of people come out of the um, Eastern provinces, the Maritimes and so forth. But in time, I think that's that will change. I think that we'll start seeing more people coming there. And hopefully in the new year, um, you guys will be up and running. Brenda will be up and running and we can get some people in British Columbia and, and hopefully some people in uh, Manitoba as well. Now, I watched uh, a bit of a StreamYards earlier tonight, uh, which Ed also was nice enough to have moderated for the people that put that on. And I see what they're doing. I know that Cody was a part of that as well. And I see what they're doing as well. And I hope that at some point in the new year, we're all able to get together and do this together. Uh, because the only way we're going to win is through we all come together on this and we get this money, uh, this me these messages out to we the people so that we can move forward, that we can do all of this. Alan, I'm not really sure. Duke, uh, Duke was talking to that gentleman in Southern Ontario. I'm not very uh, sure as to where, because he's down in Niagara on the lake. So he was, I, I believe, in that area. Um, reach out to Duke Willis. Uh, he's also a good point person. If you're interested to get involved in doing these kinds of meetings, uh, creating them for your uh, for your own communities, um, I'm working with Duke. I work with, well. I try to work with everybody. <laughs> I do have limited time, but I try to um, get as much of my time to everybody as I can. Uh, it's so important that we 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 work together for this, and I I say that the, the people that put on the, the, the um, meeting before this one, uh, the round table that they were holding, basically they were giving out the same messages that we're talking about tonight, about coming together, about creating our unity within our communities and going forward in our countries and, uh, and working together to do this, because that's the only way we're going to win. They want us divided. They want us conquered that way. But I've always said, everybody has a seat at the table and everybody has a voice. Please participate. Anybody else? I couldn't agree, with, agree more with you, Doug. There's so many groups out there and so many people that have the same sentiments and are trying different things to work towards the same goal. And I think at the end of the day, it's going to come down to us all working together to, to accomplish something, right? And uh, I, I've been working in that area for a long time trying to keep relations between all kinds of groups and i'm seeing now that uh, a whole bunch of different groups seem to be coming together and it's it's really auspicious and it shows signs of uh promise for the near future um uh to comment on some of the things that john was talking about earlier um about the state of affairs and the, con the conditions that we're in now uh the way we spend our dollar is very important um, but there's a lot of things that at this point in time, we're not able to control, you know, ways that uh, money's, money and uh, just wealth, general wealth is being siphoned out of our economies, whether it be provincially, uh, federally. You know, you take a look uh, at the mass amounts of migrant workers we have, not that it's necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but you look at the associated things that come along with that and you see the way that, that money is siphoned out of our out of our provinces, out of our towns, out of our nations, you know, by very simple things. Even having foreign um, foreign interests owning our resources and owning the companies that are dealing with our resources. Uh, in these ways, you know, if if we have the ability to to keep more things local and we're supporting more local, that's going to keep that wealth circulating within our areas rather than having it siphoned out, right? And I think that's uh, a very important thing and a very, uh, how, how to put it, uh, one of our strengths as consumers, you know, that that I think, uh, you know, look at the Tea Party. 
That was a really good example, right? You know, Cody, you can actually put clauses in the Constitution that would restrict companies like Walmart from removing. They can have a Walmart store in Edmonton and Calgary, but here's the deal. They have to be incorporated in uh, uh, Alberta. Um, they have to keep the money in Alberta for at least five years. They can't take it out unless it's for, of course, purchasing new merchandise to sell. But all the profits must stay here in Alberta. And a certain percentage of those profits, you might put the clause in the Constitution that says 10% of all their profits must be given to local charities uh, here in Alberta for the people. And that's their contribution to being able to do business in Alberta or Saskatchewan or British Columbia. And there's nothing stopping you from putting these clauses in. One more thing I wanted to say, and I for, almost forgot, uh, at the mythiscanada.ca and .com, we are creating a page for uh, everybody that's doing these constitutional committee meetings. Um, we should have the Saskatchewan pay, uh, uh, page and the um, Alberta page up next week when Sean gets back. And uh, as we get British Columbia and Manitoba and Ontario, et cetera, et cetera, they'll all have their landing page at the Myth is Canada. And really what this is, it's contact information so that people who come onto the Myth is Canada who may not be on Facebook or may not be on YouTube, they can actually make contact with you guys directly through the Myth is Canada website. We have over 2,000 followers now on the Myth is Canada website. And so it's getting more and more well known on the uh, as as we move forward and uh, i was talking like i say with sean um uh last week and uh, he assures me and i've talked to john already and uh, and brenda about putting the information cody uh your information and neil's information can also go up there along with the um, constitutional committees of alberta or alberta's constitutional committees however you want to put it up there because i i only talked to john about this so far but now we, uh, uh, when, when, like I say, when he gets back, he will be working on that. So let's get your information as well. Now we can actually make you an email if you don't have uh, an email that you want to use. I can have Cody Holler at the Myth is Canada as a contact information, or Neil Maguda at the Myth is Canada, and you'll have you can have your own emails as well for that. Well, it sounds great to me because I can yeah. send a lot of stuff I have with that email, uh, through that email. Mine's getting jammed up with a lot of everybody emailing my personal email. is absolutely crazy. <laughs> well, Neil, why don't we, you and I will talk after uh, after this and I'll get you to do a small write up and uh, and with your <coughs> with your stuff. That sounds and, great. Uh, and likewise for Cody as well. And. Uh, I think, you know, when we look at clauses that need to go into the Constitution, you're absolutely right, John and Cody, that we need to look at what we can do locally and buy locally and support locally. What your guys are doing with the restaurant owner in, uh, in Edmonton there, I think it's marvelous um, being that you're that and she's working with you because she sees the opportunity. So, yeah, stuff like that. I mean, when you're looking at, at doing your committee meetings, why go and to a, a chain hotel and rent the facility with the money leaves Alberta. Go look at your local community centers or your libraries and, and stuff like that where the money will stay. I've actually inquired about a few uh, law school that my son goes to and apparently that's a no-no. You can't hand out any sort of documentation and be there the government, though, right? But I asked the principal. Hey, wait a minute. Isn't this a provincially funded building? Aren't I paying for this building? Oh, well, you can. Now, why are they it. flying the Canadian flag up front? God, yeah, we need to get into that. We're, but we're going to probably this week sometime. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> the flags that represent ownership and authority. And why is the federal flag the dominant, prominent flag? on City Hall, on all these provincially owned buildings. It didn't make sense to me. And I had phoned and tried to find out why 
but I essentially just got the runaround for it, which I mean, what do you expect, right? Well, and that's why they, they, when they did the maritime incorporation in 1982 over over the Meech Lake and the Charlottetown Accords, those those signatures on those accords minus Quebec uh, were actually them accepting the subcorporation, sub maritime incorporation. Uh, that tied them to the federal authority, which once again, it comes back to section 109 of the British North American Act. It's not about uh, them being good to you. It's about them having control over you and the control over your resources, the control over your water supply, the control over your forestry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, also means control over your lives through taxation and through licensing and through pretty much anything. Uh, you want to start a business today? Do you know how much hoopla dupla you have to go through to do that? Especially, John, you're as a carpenter. Um, I, I often tease John about that because I say he's the new JC. <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to offend any Christians in the audience today. Uh, but JC was a carpenter and a fisherman. But... Um, the, the, the amount of BS that you have to go through in order to earn a living today in the land that's yours, on the land that's yours, um, it just doesn't make any sense. Not to mention the services you pay for that are not adequate. I, in fact, got in an argument with a TELUS guy. Well, it was more of a debate. A TELUS guy today over my internet. And it's, I mean, I'm sure everybody can relate. Hey. And this is one of the many problems that we face on a daily basis. The TELUS guy shows up, well, you got to do this, you got to do that. And my position is, why do I have to do anything? I'm paying for this service. Make it work or get it out of here. Which should be everyone's position. I, like Doug said, I'm a carpenter. You're going to hire me for a job. Can I come to your house and tell you you got to go buy me a skill saw in order for it to work? Doesn't make much sense, does it? Yet, utility companies, uh, cell phone providers, all of these people, can every day we're being taken advantage of. And this, the importance of what we're trying to accomplish here is is so immense because in every aspect of everyday life, we get screwed. Every day, someone is in our pockets and there's not enough in the pockets for us, let alone to pay someone. Then, you know, you get the collection agency after you, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's, it's just a spiral effect that it, it's, it's made to hurt you. By no way is it made to help you, you know? <clears throat> And I just think it's a shame that, that we've evolved into this. And I think it's a great time that now we're, we have an opportunity to completely reverse things. But in order to do that, we need to unite, um, you know, with the paycheck to paycheck thing. Well, would Cody and Neil and I like to cruise up to Fort Mac or, you know, down to Red Deer or uh, out to Hinton or out to Lloyd Minster or wherever hey. all over the province? Sure, we'd love to. But... How the hell are we getting there? Stop. We're paycheck to paycheck too. I mean, we can only do what we can do. And Christmas is coming. Everybody's got bills. It's it's a tough go for everybody. Please help if you can. Uh, donate to the Mythos Canada so that we can get some funding to pay for photocopying, pay for coffee at these events, pay for, you know, it, everything's so damn expensive these days. It's ridiculous. But we need help. Uh, we're not doing this for self-improvement, let's say. We're doing this for our country because we're patriots. And uh, John, yeah, I just I, I I want to interrupt you. I know you're on a good roll here, but here's the thing: if people are going to donate to the Myth is Canada, please make a note within your donation that it's to go to the Constitutional Committee in Ontario, it's in uh, Manitoba, or it's in uh, Saskatchewan, it's in Alberta. Um, that way I can direct the money to where it needs to go. Otherwise, it just goes into the general fund. 
And I would prefer if you're if you're looking to do these kinds of donations through the myth until they get set up with their own system. Um, on PayPal, you can make a note as to where you want to see that money uh, gone to, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that you can also make a, a note within an e-transfer. You can do that with as well. And that way I will direct the money properly where it's supposed to go. That's all that I brings to say. Me, well, Yeah, and that brings me to my next point about going to the Mythos Canada under swag and buying your six tutorial DVD set. The best gift you can get anyone for Christmas is working on and securing our future. Because currently we don't have one. You know, um, check out the UN agenda 2130. And I realize that we get on here, and a lot of a lot of the viewers we have are repeat viewers, let's say. So everybody already knows the information or a lot of it, but there's still so much more to learn. I learn stuff every day. I try and uh, try and do something. You know, I was in Best Buy today buying this stupid cable. You tell this guy told me to, and here I am talking to people about the Mythos Canada. My first question to people is. Are you happy with your government? And 9.5 people out of 10 say no, they're not. And they want to change. But I'm finding that Canadians are so complacent that everyone feels that they're secure in their own little bubble, that nobody wants to do anything. Nobody wants to act. And, I mean, let's face it, there's leaders and there's followers. And either one, it's fine. But we've got to be led by the right people because the current leaders we have that have been elected are leading us astray and are deep in, digging their hands deeper in our pockets every day. And uh, we we got to put a stop to it. We have to do this. I mean, I've heard timelines uh, between six and eight months we can make this happen. So the question is, you know, all you people watching, are you going to get off your butts? Are we going to start doing something? Or are we just going to keep paying 60% taxes and keep getting hosed every day? You know, what are you comfortable with? And really, it comes down to your own decision. Um, I don't ask people to get involved. It's not a cult. We don't want you to join. If you want to participate, by all means, please do. Reach out. You know, I put my uh, Discord server up there. I put my MeWe channel up there. Contact us. You know, we'll get you some information. But Doug's tutorial DVD set is 20 bucks. Who doesn't got 20 bucks to spend it's cheap, you know, drink six less beer this Christmas. Not a big deal. Get it and start learning. And it's one of the videos that you're going to have to watch three or four times, and that's why I recommend buying it. And that's that's going to be what we're educating on as well, but we're going to get a lot more in-depth with it, right? Because there's going to be a lot of questions. And that's why you need to be on the Discord channel so you can see when we're coming to your community to see when you can attend. You know, of course, they're free events. We're not doing charge admission or nothing. We just want people to show up. We want people to learn. We want people we teach to start teaching as well. You know, hey. uh, mindset. We've got to start changing our mindset from being slaves to being prosperous because it can be done. Next. <laughs> I totally agree. We need to get together. Um, unity. Uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm almost sick of that word unity. Um, it's overused. It's overdone. Um, can't we just talk? Can't we create dialogue? Can't we um, discuss the things that are important to us? Let's, let's just do that. We need to, everybody's a, a people here. And I, I look at, the people I deal with, even at the school. And, you know, you make a, a, a comment about, oh, guess what, I, I'm um, doing a round table um, and we're talking about the constitution. And they say, well, we got a constitution. And I just, okay, well, did, did you read the very bottom of what our constitution says or what you think our constitution says? We're called loyal subjects. Really? <laughs> you know, like, um, or what part of what part of the charter of rights um, actually pertains to you? So I ask people these questions, and they say, "Well, 
I said, well, you know what? You might want to check this out. And I handled um, one of my flyers from the Myth of Canada. I've been doing that to a, a lot of um, oh, people that come in and visit. I keep them in my car. Um, I, I hand them out whenever I'm shopping, whatever I'm doing. That's what I'm, that's what I do. It's not just a, a Facebook thing. It's, it's got to be meet people face to face. Um, and it's almost like living it. That's what we do is create awareness. And lots of people don't want to, they don't want to discuss the, the government. Oh, that's taboo. And, you know, somebody asked me once, uh, haven't you been shot yet? And I'm going, why, what am I doing wrong? I'm providing a solution or suggesting a solution. And, uh, somebody says okay well it's really something then and I said yes it is it's really something it's not it's not a pipe dream we can make this happen and but it has to be we it can't be me and that's about that's about all I can say is it's it's got to be the will of the people and by um, talking to people and helping understand where they are um and ask them if you could change one thing what would it be write it down on a piece of paper now your voice is heard if you could change one thing what would it be and i ask people to put that in the document email it put it in the document just uh, take a link or email me and I'll give you a link. It's sovereigns of Saskatchewan Unite at gmail.com. I think I put it in the in the chat. I don't know if it came up across or not. But anyway, ah. that's I'm sorry, I wasn't sure because it's you were it was posting under me. Oh as dear. if I posted. Oh, and, okay. Oh, but, sorry. But no, I, go, I I put chat. I'm sorry. That was uh, I actually, oh, I removed it because I I went I didn't oh, post that what the heck is going on Oh no I I see what I did no it was me I I'm will, sorry. I will fix this no no I'm sorry I thought somebody had hacked me I'm going what the heck is going on here that's why I was oh, looking no, down that was me <laughs> Okay Oops Oopsie my my oh, I didn't my my error No no I just put I I just put it in the wrong chat. That's funny. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, there we go. no, no. Please. No, it please. went there. It went under you again. That's okay. We'll leave it under me. We'll leave it there. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, now that I know it's it's okay. I didn't I'm freaking out like it's oh, the, it's this that. device. No, it's this device where I that's the only place I can type chat in. I'm happy to allow. Go for Thank it. Thank you. I can't type chat in the live comments. I don't have the bar at the bottom to enter my text. I can in private, but not on the live. Yeah, yeah. I got the same thing going. Can't so, get private, not live. So I hope you guys got to you got to go to YouTube or Facebook to do that. And yeah. you go to the YouTube. Uh, the myth uh, Nephilim Films presents the myth is Canada. Actually, I can uh, send it over in the private chat, and I can uh, copy and paste it and put it in the chat that way if you want. Cool. There you go. So I'm coming sorry. back. No, 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 no. Coming back, it, it just it just freaked me out a little bit because I was like, wait a minute, I didn't type. Anyway, um, we got a little bit off topic here. So, but coming back to when we start looking at the creation of clauses for the Constitution, there's a lot of stuff that we take for granted today that the government does for us that is part of the nanny state that we're probably not going to want when we see the de jure government because in order for that nanny state to give us that stuff um they charge us 10 times what it would cost to do in the private sector so this is the other thing that, may, that people may want to look at when they're creating clauses uh for the constitution is looking at what the nanny state is is doing today uh, and then making sure that they can't do that in the future. In other words, 
Now you're going to look at putting clauses in that lock the government out. Okay. Yes, you're going to have clauses in there that lock the government in, but then you're also going to have clauses in there that lock them out from 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 going beyond the Constitution into other aspects of your life. And some of them could be as simple as um, having people who cut hair for a living have to go through uh, a, a licensing process um, that is not necessary. You know, people that do uh, that do massage therapy um, and have certified from schools that private schools that actually teach the massage therapy now also have to go to the government and write their and get licensed for that. It's ridiculous. I mean, the, 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 yeah, okay, fine. You're a, uh, a a truck driver. Yes, there are certain aspects um, of, of, of heavy equipment that you should learn and be certified in doing that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the government has to do that. Um, there will be schools. I mean, look at you, Neil. You're a heavy equipment operator, and you've been doing it now for, what, about 20 years? Uh, and you're sort of... Going on 33 years I've been doing well, this. And, and so, but you're certified on all kinds of vehicles. No. And Alberta does not mean? need certification. Oh, that's nice then. It's well, uh, a moot point in Alberta. Hot but I'm, uh, yep. I'm certified. Uh, maybe, I sh yeah, maybe I should have shut up now that the, in case the Alberta government's listening tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up and now you're going to have to write 10 tickets. <laughs> Sorry, Neil. 10 tickets. Uh, there'd be a lot more than 10 tickets. I spent probably you know another ten I mean. years learning, how, uh, going through all their testing. No, but you know what I mean. I, I, yeah, but just actually, the but, best example would be Ed. He is a pilot. Oh, okay. All that stuff that he's well, had to go through. Well, and and but Ed, most of his stuff has come from. He's had to pay for it himself. He had to go. To, he had to go to pilot school, and he paid somebody to teach him how to do this. And then the government comes along and sticks their their beak in the in the well and says, "Okay, Ed, you've all you've spent ten thousand dollars learning how to fly. Now you're going to spend another thousand dollars because we're going to give you a license." Well, what was their contribution? Nothing except to stick their hand in his wallet. You know, the certification from the pilot school should be enough. Well, Saskatchewan and, and, came and, and, up with. Go ahead. I was, Sorry, Saskatchewan, man. after the Humboldt accident, now has a certified truck driver school, and it costs $10,000 to go through this thing to get your your license. Uh, yes, the Humboldt For your 1A, for your 1A. Oh, the... There it was, was hor a, horrific, but... It to, was. To, but to be that foolish, uh, it, it's the same thing as... Oh, well, look what happened at Sandy Hook as an example in the United States. Well, let's right. steal, let's take everybody else's gun away from them. Well, the only people who, who will be driving truck will be criminals. And they don't care because they don't, they're not going to look at the law. And if they get in an accident, they'll just abandon the, the vehicle and let the people die anyways, because now they're uncertified. It's the same thing with, with, with guns. If they start taking away legal guns, the only people without legal guns <laughs> are the criminals and they criminals love gun control that's their favorite thing in the united states where they have these gun free zones we we used to call them when i was living down there target rich environments because nobody shoots back <laughs> yeah yeah well it, it would be the same thing as uh creating a drunk driving lane on the highway wouldn't it exactly <laughs> <They're> drunk drivers <laughs> The bumper car lane is what you'd call it. Oh, go. well, yeah, whatever. It's, but you it's just um, the, the social bylaws that are there. I don't know why they're there, but, you know, like the fines that you can pay, pay just try to uh, stand outside and have a cigarette within 15 meters of a doorway and see what happens, you know. Well, I well, mean, that's a safety thing, but. They're all there for our protection, Brenda. Oh we, yeah, we can't yeah. Be I, make I, same I, choices. You can't, you can't legislate common sense. Good grief, you know. 
Well, and, and that's just the problem. And this is something that we have to look at when you're, when you, you, you'll have to look at when you're creating the constitutions, we the people will look at. And, and it's, it's restricting the government from its overreach on regulations. It's restricting. So there's a positive uh, uh, clauses for your constitution. There's also the negative clauses that have to be thought through as well that restrict and, and tie the hands of the government. So that even in future generations in 200 years from now, they can't misinterpret what's being said because that's what they've done. They were able to do when they moved the constitution from common law into maritime jurisdiction. Now they could bring in interpretations in the United States. So it's all interpretive, like interpretive dance, you know, Woo! <laughs> one guy comes out and does one thing and another guy comes out and does the other same piece of music. Somebody, um, no, it was um, Jarrett texted me um, sort of like a, a, a constitution on um, recipe. Just a minute, I'll find that. I was reading through it today and I. And reciprocity. <laughs> well, reciprocity. No, it's, it's, it's uh, yes, that's the, but it's more to do with, just a minute, I'm going to find That's this. the one you sent to me. Yes, I have um, it right. I have it. I have it right uh, here. Propertarianism. Yes. Yes, and it's, it, it's, I was, it, it's an interesting document. Interesting concepts. Well, and they have a they have a couple of things that I read through with Darwinism, for example, uh, Darwinian eras, uh, revolutions, and we should consider proprietarianism in intellectual history as complete completion of the Darwin, uh, Darwinian scientific revolution of the 19th and 20th centuries. The problem with Dar Dar Darwinism, it was, it's been disproven now for almost 100 years. Yeah. So there, it's like, it's like saying climate change is settled science, and we, we have to base our constitution on that settled science. It's yeah. pseudoscience. Right. But re reciprocity was very interesting. They call it the law of reciprocity. So I looked it up and, there, and, and the law of reciprocity is based on what they call universal law. And universal law is very interesting because it's based on, well, nothing. <laughs> it has no foundation in any sort of law. And right. so it's when you're starting, this is more, this is more of a philosopher's uh, constitution than a practical constitution that you can use. Right. You need to- I, I just thought some of the concepts were kind of kind of different. Well, they yeah. are. It's, it's really interesting to read. And and I suggest, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll put up the link okay. in the chat so that people can go take a look at it because everything, there we go. I'll put it up in Facebook and I'm going to put it up also in we on the YouTube chat. It's important that we get a good look at everything. Yeah. It may not be applicable, but people will get ideas from it that could become applicable. Right. Here's one to depoliticize, restore the rule of law and markets. You know, and um, that it was, that's that actually, what we were. That actually makes sense because that's a laissez-faire market. That that laissez-faire market is a free market. That means that the the government isn't involved. They there there might be rules, but there is no government involvement. In other words, the government doesn't manipulate the market for their favorites. Ooh, I like Rob Moffat. Had, this is really cool. The science relating to climate change is behavioral science, eugenics, and the bastardization of real science. Science is never settled. Thank you, Rob. What a wonderful way to say that. If science was always settled, we'd still be uh, spraying ourselves down with DDT. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cyclone B. Yeah, right. And I so think... Uh, Nope. Sorry if I can just jump in here. Brenda, can you go through the process of what you've been doing to get people involved and in what you've been doing to get people organized? 
and just kind of walk us through what the process is for uh, getting people to talk about what a constitution is. Ah, well, everybody has to do it in their own way. Um, you do what you're comfortable with. If you're comfortable um, talking to a group of people, then you talk to a group of people. If you're more comfortable one-on-one, -on -one, that's what you do. Um, how to make it um, feel like a unified, um, unified effort is you had to, I, I started by giving a place where people could go to, um, to talk or to put down ideas. And, and um, that was the document. That's also my Soul Saskatchewan page. Um, at the top of the page is, uh, it's a group. And it says, if you're not working on the constitution, this group isn't for you. Um, we don't allow a lot of government ads or uh, news stories unless you can point out, hey, what in this story can we fix in our constitution? And if you can, if you post that, then you have to, you also have to post the fix, not just, not just the story of what can we do to fix it. And, and it's getting people involved that way. Um, Again, it's, it's talking to people when you're shopping, talking to your hairdresser, talking to um, your banker, talking to the person in standing in line is, is really a good place to start a conversation. Everybody's just waiting. And that, what do you talk about? Well, I, I, I'm not one of these that likes to, you know, just talk about the weather. I'd rather talk about the Constitution. My partner, on the other hand, Dale, would rather talk about the weather. But, um, I mean, that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, and he's talking about the weather. <laughs> anyway, um, what else did I do? Um, I, my first one, I, I had two people three people, there was Ralph, Ralph and I, rented a hall and we started passing out flyers for the first meeting. We had Dallas and Darlene come in and um, I don't know, we had about a half a dozen or a dozen people that, that actually came um, and we live fed it. So people were watching, yeah, we're doing this. And from that meeting, it started growing. People started emailing. Um, they asked me for the email address for the, the doc or sent me their email address so I could send them a doc, a link to the document. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. And it's going to continue growing. Uh, people like what they're seeing. They like participating and they like talking about it. So when you've got that level of, of activity with your people, it just grows. It, word of mouth is by far the quickest and, and best way of doing it. Um, I don't know, how are you doing with yours, Neil? You probably have just as many people as me. I'm sorry, I had a little hiccup with mine uh i'm still working on it trying to get people to come in and add things to it i've pretty much left it alone just giving them basically a way to just do something it's going to be a slow process for alberta right now till uh, <clears throat> till after christmas it's going to be a little slow with things going on I, um, I agree. I got the February booking for Fort Mac. I have another one for the end of March. That's the one I'd like Cody and John, if they can join me with that one. Everything will be paid for. It'll be three days. Uh, we'll be going Fort Mac. We'll be going to Fort Mackay. 
and a flight to Fort Chip. If you guys are, would like to do that. Like, we got to get the First Nations on board with us, too, at the same time. Hey, Neil, you want to throw me a plane ticket? I'll, I'll go with you if they don't want to. <laughs> well, I got to talk to two certain guys in the next in the new year, and you probably will end up it will be plane tickets. Right? There will it will have a vehicle rented when we get there, <clears throat> and then it'll be the flight going up to uh, Fort Chip to talk with the band members and see what we can do. So if you're interested in it, uh, let me know and I'll see exactly what we can book. I'm going to try to book the hotel with them and they'll pay, have that all paid for. So Joe, uh, Cody and John, if you're interested, uh, I'll give you a call after the show and we'll figure something out and get that in the works. Sure, we can even stay, I think, in this lobby after we uh, cut the live feed and continue the discussion a little bit afterwards. And I would like to have Doug come out uh, for the one in Fort Mac and the one in, well, when we go to the uh, first, uh, to see the First Nations. I have some friends that are going to make sure that we can get out to one of them without having any problems. I'd just like to make a comment here. I noticed a lot of comments right since the beginning of the feed. People saying, you know, how do you peak interest for this? Because a lot of people, for a lot of people, this constitutional discussion and debate is a really dry topic. You know, it reminds them of school it reminds them of uh, social studies and it's not something that a lot of people find very palatable but uh, I noticed somebody else mentioned a comment that uh, Doug has made mention a few times about if we had stopped equalization payments um, that the amount of revenue going out would be equal to the the people in Alberta receiving a seven thousand dollar a month check every single man and woman in the province of Alberta receiving the $7,000 check. That's just one point out of so many. Um, when it comes down to, to selling this to people, it isn't really that hard when you look at all of the, the pluses that can be associated with it, all the things that we have to gain. I mean, it's really easy to focus on the problems and what we have to lose. I mean, we all have a stake in this, especially people with children, uh, even people without children. And I mean, there's so many benefits that can be associated with this, not only for every man and woman, but also on a corporate level as well, right? And I think it's it's understanding the type of restrictions that we're under and the type of abilities that we could be granted, not only to ourselves, but uh, for corporations as well. And the ways that we could actually prosper under a de jure government. I think that is one of the easiest ways to pique people's interest. I mean, John said it himself. He always starts the conversation with, are you happy with your government? That was one of the questions we were asking people when I traveled across Canada this summer. And do you trust politicians, right? Start the conversation with things that you know people can relate to and then bring in positives, you know, things that uh, can have a detriment, or like not a detrimental, uh, an extremely positive effect on all of our lives, right? I mean, people might not be interested to sit down and, and hear all about, you know, the constitutional uh, reality that we have in Canada, but people are really interested when you start talking about the things that, that can bring positive changes into their lives, right? And I think that's that's a really good way to, to start discussion on these topics, right? Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Cody, and that kind of all comes back to mindset. And, you know, for the last year, we, we keep hearing people complain, the government this and taxes that and blah, 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 blah. I'll tell you right now, there is an end to it. And that's when we write our own constitution and boot the government out. We, we've really got to focus on not doing 
the complaining and start focusing on the how are we moving forward? What can I do? How can I participate? Right? <clears throat> and it really is mindset. Um, we, we've all got to, we, we've been trained to be where we are today. Why we think today that we're helpless essentially against this government is because they've been training us for a hundred years to feel exactly like we are. There's a lot of smart people in this country. Sorry, this landmass known as Canada. And it's time for these people to start coming out and helping their neighbors, helping their friends, helping their kids. My kid made a Myth is Canada Christmas decoration this year. Can we show them? <laughs> yeah, show them. He wants to show you now. So I thought it was pretty awesome that he would do that. And, you know, yeah. although he's only eight years old, he's, uh, he's understanding, not, not fully, but... See, everyone? Isn't that awesome? Oh, that's Handmade. cute. Handmade. First one ever. So, John, you'll have to tape that to your Big Myth is Canada. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. I said um, the tree goes down for sure. We'll have to do that. But it's, it's just the little things, you know. And Jackson said to me one night, is Justin Trudeau coming here? I said, no. No, he's not coming here. Why would you ask me that? Because he ruins everything. <laughs> it's okay, man. He's, he's not coming. We're good. <laughs> he's not coming here. So back to mindset. Um, you know, even living life, we know that making positive, healthy choices give us positive, healthy results. The same applies to this. We've got to get in a frame of mind where we want to have better lives. We want to get out of this rut that we're in. And everybody does. Who doesn't want more money for for Christmas, for birthdays, for camping and holidays in the summertime? Maybe you're the kind of person that likes to fly to Mexico or overseas, you know, whatever you want to do. I mean, different strokes for different folks. And that's cool. But if we can't afford to do it, well, then... There's trouble, and there's a lot of people out there that are likely just like me, and if you don't work your butt off, you're not getting anything. Nothing's coming to you on a silver platter, and that's just the way it is, right? Um, so moving forward, get involved. Send, join my uh, Discord channel group. Join my MeWe group. I got punted off Facebook because I posted Myth is Canada stuff, and... It was a bit of a shocker at first, but now I'm okay with it. But uh, it, it was another good tool to use as well. I mean, fortunately, we still have quite a few people on there. So, And there's other resources, like Discord, where we can all get together and you can find out what's happening in your community, when something's happening, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Like, it's, uh, it's a good tool. So, got to get up for a bunch of people. I was going to say, John, the other thing that um, um, you guys can start looking at doing is creating talking points for people and posting, you know, questions that people can ask other people um, about, you know, like what you were saying. So do uh, you like your government? That's a good question. How about do you like uh, GST or do you like PST or how about carbon tax on your fuel, you know, you can ask engaging questions and maybe that would be something that everybody involved here on the, on the uh, chats um, can start posting within the Facebook groups is questions that others could ask others to engage in conversation. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, a lot of people need help with those icebreaker questions, essentially. And in order for that to happen, you people need to reach out to me or Neil. Hey, wait a minute. You said, wait, don't, don't, stop. You said we, you people. You can't. <laughs> We're on Facebook. You said you people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Political correct. Me. You Error. people kind. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 
need to, but you guys got to reach out. And unless you think there's a chance, I'm going to run into you at Safeway or the library or uh, the YMCA in Edmonton, you know, because I'm always talking to people wherever I go. But my point is I can't pick someone off this list right here. And so I'm going to email this guy and, and, and tell him, I mean, you've got to reach out. This is part of getting off your butt, right? You got to, you got to take the first step. And all it's going to take is some communication. We, we encourage anyone, even if you don't want information, write an email just to say hi, good job, or bad job, or whatever. I mean, we encourage any kind of uh, response and activity because it also helps us um, guide our path and kind of hone in on our path on what we should do, right? If we're doing things that offend people, well, then we probably shouldn't be doing those things. We do want to be respectful. I mean, I respect every one of you people out there. And uh, sometimes, well, we're all human. We make mistakes and things happen. And it's nothing to quick, I'm sorry, don't won't fix. And, and, you know, you move forward like everything else in life. So here's what we got to do, you know, reach out. I'll give you some questions. Sure. I got all kinds of ideas. We could write a song. I play guitar. You know, we can do all kinds of things, but we don't have the people to do it with. I mean, I think there's 15 people on the Discord that I started like just last night. So I mean, it's it's it started, it's coming, but uh, it's it's a good communication tool for us all. You know, a debate channel for the people that that don't think there's validity to this and the information that the myth is providing. Like Cal Kennedy put in the chat, there's a twenty-five thousand dollar reward for anyone that can produce a constitution or federation papers for Canada or the landmass known as Canada. 25K. Well, who couldn't use that? I mean, this isn't the first reward that's been offered either. The, the problem is it hasn't been offered to the masses like it is now. Because one thing the government and the elites of the world didn't plan on was us using this as a tool to educate each other. And now that we are, that's great. <clears throat> and there's still a lot of disbelievers out there. There's, there's, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, and I respect that. It's in, completely up to you which way it goes. But should things go south, you want to make sure you're ready. And you got to ask yourself, why is this happening all over the world? And it's because the world has had enough of the greed and the corruption. It's crazy. I've seen videos of the police shooting their citizens in Chile and France. You know, Paris is getting out of control, and that's been going on for a year now. And like, people are dying doing this. They've, they've got a very firm hold on us, and it's going to take a big bang from us to, to release us from this stronghold that we're held captive in. And all we can do is keep trying, one day at a time, you know? Offer people hope. I mean, that's that's what we're trying to do, I think, more than anything, is is showing that there is another way. That's Offering right. Offering people hope. And one of the best ways to engage conversation is to ask questions. It is to reach out to people and ask for simply their opinion. To ask for help and say, hey, this is this is an idea we have, or here's a topic, and, and what are your opinions? I need your help. Come help us by adding to the conversation, right? Absolutely. Um, this is such an amazing, I keep coming back to this, it's such an amazing time. Humanity is is living at, we're, we're, we're about to see a global change, not just a local change, but a global change. And we are part of that. And by doing what we're doing within the countries that make up the landmass known as Canada, we can actually be a leader in that world change. And that's what makes this so amazing is that for the next thousand years, if we are successful, well, when we are successful, we can see it easily a thousand years of peace because of the, because we put this power back into the hands of we the people. And any politician who wants to go to war 
you can put the clause in your constitution that if a politician declares war, it's him and it would be him and his family that go over the hill first. They will lead the charge, but it will be him and his family. <laughs> you think maybe his family might say something to him before he makes declaration of war? So there's an opportunity here to bring peace to the world. And how wonderful would that be? What does, your, what does your ideal country look like? Who, me? Oh, anybody. That's the question. What does your ideal country look like? Are we Peace, living it? Prosperity, abundance. I mean, I think in a, in a perfect world, uh, we would have an education system that fosters creativity. Moreover than just simple, um, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic and uh, repetition, but actual uh, something that fosters creative thinking, critical thinking, individual thinking, education on important topics, you know, such as the true history of governments, the true history of jurisdictions of law, um, uh, true education right down to everything from uh growing your own food to firearm safety training to you know in my opinion i think that our children are our future and in order to prevent from happening what has happened to us now it starts with them right it starts with with taking back control of the minds of our children because really fundamentally i think that this entire battle because it is what it is is it's a battle for our consciousness and I think regaining control over that is is one of the best things we could do, you know. I agree with you, Cody. Um, the battle is over our consciousness. Where where is your awareness today? And a lot of it isn't in what's happening around us. A lot of it is in that little box that everybody looks at, you know. It's 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 sort of like you you watch somebody watching television. They're going, you know that that stare. It's like me uh, watching watching um, you guys on the round table, and I'm going, uh, yeah, okay, I agree. <laughs> but awareness and. And I deal with, with um, teaching um, creativity. Um, that comes with music. Uh, it, it just is hand in hand. It, it releases the, the creative flow. And so when I jumped on with, with the Myth is Canada, I approached Doug and said, okay, what can I do? How can I get this, this going? And I just took the reins and sometimes I went in the raw, totally wrong direction. And other times I picked up steam and people decided, yeah, maybe this is something to work on. And it's up to them. If they decide that it's something to work on and it's something worthwhile, it's going to happen. It's just, it has to be the will of the people and education and informing. We can't be scared of making mistakes. No, no. That's, that's how we learn, so... Can't be afraid to make mistakes along the way. I, I totally commend everything you're doing, Brenda. You've taken, uh, you know, the forefront on this, and it's it's quite admirable. I mean, of course, we're going to make mistakes along the way, but the only thing we have to be worried about is not learning from those mistakes. Oh, and learning's a constant thing, and it's it's wonderful. Um, I, you don't go into this thinking you know everything, because I don't, and I I. I toss ideas out there and let somebody run with it. If you want to run with that one, go, go, go. I'm, I'm not a micromanager. Just wherever you want to pitch in, you pitch in. If you can do this, do it. You know, if you've got a better way of, of showing something than I do, great. Do it. Teach me how. Right? It's, it's, it's a unified, uh, unified, I hate that word. It's, it's, a joint effort with all of us. 
Well, and, and we really do have to learn by trial and error because the last time um, somebody actually sat down and wrote a constitution for we the people was in 1787, 88 in Philadelphia. Hi, and, Duke. And so this is, this is a unique opportunity for all of us. And it will be done through trial and error, and we will make mistakes, and we will fall down, and we will get back up. Because there's no other way to do this. Hello, Duke Willis, and welcome to the roundtable this evening on constitutionals. Huh? What are they? And how do you write one? He's muted. So stop Act muting Lacks yourself. Solve that. There you, go. Oh, there you go. Oh, wait a well, minute. That's, that wasn't a constitution. Oh, wrong word. Me bad. So how's everybody making out? You guys had some really good points when I was in the chat room earlier. Doug, you were talking about how taxes don't have to be taxes. You can put it into your constitution that if a company wants to do business, they've got to do it this way. And profit has to go to here, not to a government coffer, to the people. No, exactly. And it's, it's really up to everybody's own imagination as to what goes into these constitutions and the flexibility, provided that you stay within the parameters that you set out, the architecture. As I, when we started the conversation this evening, I talked about architecture and the creation of the foundation of the jurisdictions of law that you will be applying to it. And then the type of government, whether it be a direct democracy, a, a democratic republic, a fascist regime, doesn't matter. It has to be contained within. From specific. there, you can, you can be specific as to the type of government like and the law. Yes, not leaving any room for interpretation. To be tie them, tie them yeah. there's there's a key word cody interpretation and that word applies to our use of the language and it's one of the reasons why doug pointed out something to me well over a year ago and it's been in the back of my head and something i am deeply founded on when you write your constitution and, and you look at constitutions, you'll have one primary sentence as a clause in the constitution and then a paragraph below it discussing that clause. That main clause where it says, whatever, every man and woman is created equal, rewrite it in Greek underneath because Greek is a pure language. It can't be interpreted or reinterpreted. It is what it is, unchangeable. Unlike the English language that has S-E-E, S-E-A, both sound the same, can be pronounced the same, but when written, mean totally different things. They are T-H-E-I-R, T-H-E-R-E, T-H-E-Y, apostrophe R-E. That doesn't exist in Greek. The ability for the English language to be Frankensteined into taking three separate words, not with standing, morph it into one word, and rearrange the meaning of the individual three used individually, not with standing, meaning it's not with any standing or support. It has no meaning, no credibility. That's what standing means. Now we see it used in our laws and in our judiciary and in our legal government documents, notwithstanding clause number one, and we the people have no idea what it means because the language has been bastardized against us. 
use a language that can't be bastardized for those key, not the whole document, just those key phrases at the header or primary line of your constitutional clause, we the people believe that there, there will be no taxes on personal income. A man's labor is not taxable. Rewrite that in Greek underneath and then put a paragraph below it that further explains what you mean. But make sure your main clause is written clearly in your mother tongue. If Alberta wants to adopt their own language of Cree and English, then do it and use that mother tongue to write your constitution, okay? But rewrite it in an absolutely the only known pure language on the planet is Greek. It can't be reinterpreted a hundred years from now like we've watched them do in the U.S. When the founding fathers gave the people the ability to impeach their president, they didn't do it with the intention of it being used the way we're seeing it being used today. And that's because they didn't write their words in uninterpretable form. Also, do there is a way to write English that is very restrictive. In other words, what's written on the page, that's it. And there was a gentleman that I ran into, gosh, it must be 10 years ago now, who wrote all of his legal documents so that when you read them, you could read them down or you could read them backwards. And they always said exactly the same thing. Not up for interpretation. It's very interesting. I, I still have some of his legal <laughs> documentation that he's created. It's amazing the 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 uh, way that it was done, but it was timeless. It's literally timeless. Uh, the way that it, that he had them structured, and once you learn how to do it, I mean, he could write this stuff very quickly. But it took him probably two or three years to to learn it by doing it. But when it, he would he would create these documents, he created some documents that I was looking at uh, for myself, and uh, and that's some of the stuff that I still have. Um, just really cool, and there it's not something that you would you can misinterpret when you read it. It reads one way and it, but it also reads backwards the same way are you referring so to quantum grammar or i i don't re i don't recall honestly cody what he called it it very likely could be that um i i don't recall i just know that um he's an older gentleman i don't know if he's he's he, i haven't talked well, I see, to him probably. see somebody commenting and uh, i'm aware of it is quantum grammar by david Wynn miller is that the gentleman that you're referring to or is it somebody else Hmm. I think it might, I, I'd have to look at the documents. Um, I, I don't recall. It's been over, it's been at least 10 years since the last time I looked, but they're proper really unique, syntax. proper syntax, but it, it was amazing the way that they were written, that they couldn't be misinterpreted. And in this world that we live in, in color of law, he was creating documents that you could file into the courts that couldn't be read another way. They locked once they were accepted, they were locked. They locked the courts. And it's wow. really kind of cool. It's really kind of cool. Yeah. But it had everything Pros, to do. Whoop, I just lost it. Ed had it up there on the screen for a second, if you guys. There it is. Prose, syntax, correction, grammar. Is that what they're talking about, Cody? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. It's quantum grammar, proper syntax. And yeah, I know that David Wynn Miller was was promoting that quite heavily years ago. What I'll do is tomorrow I'll or to, I don't have time tomorrow. Um, Wednesday, I'm busy tomorrow and Tuesday. Um, I'll go through the hard drives. I'll make note of that tonight to go dig it up. And then when I find it, oh great! Now Doug's going to make me learn the English language frontwards and backwards. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> Cody, it's all your fault for bringing this up. 
<laughs> Great. Do you guys have any idea what it was like growing up with a mother who was a newspaper editor and would yell at me for leaving a hanging partic participle at the end of a sentence? I was 11 years old. I thought a participle was something Einstein worked on with protons. But no, it's some kind of word. You don't finish a sentence with it. I still don't know what it means, but... Now he wants me to learn. You're going to make me oh, learn it, aren't you, Doug? Absolutely. You're going to become. The, you're going to be. You're going to become the expert, so that everybody yeah. will then come to all, you. All of the people watching this, and all the people that talk to me, Doug, they all think I'm your right hand man. What you people don't know, I'm his guinea pig. I'm the little guinea pig in the maze, and he goes, "Hey, if this guy can figure it out, everybody can." I'm the guinea pig. I'm not, I'm not, not, not right hand. The only right hand I get is when he smacks me in the ass and says, hurry up through the maze faster, rabbit faster. Look, we had fun last Wednesday night. Did we not? <laughs> yes, we did. Now, come on, enough joking around. Get back to your conversation, guys. We, we had a little levity and everybody had a chuckle. Brenda's even got a smile on. But uh, coming, coming back to, to the constitutions and so forth, Duke, you make a very fine point um, when you say that you, you want to lock the language. And coming into uh, a good example is I, I love the I love the U.S. Constitution because there's so many good and bad examples within that Constitution of the mistakes you can make, but also the way that it, it there's a lot of positive things about it as well. And the first three words of that Constitution are the ones that I think are the best of all. Whenever you're going to create a constitution, it should always start with we, the people, and go from there. Because there's no misinterpretation as to who the sovereigns are. Period. And I've had I've said I've had people say, well, you know, the the U.S. Constitution was for the signatories only, and they designed it just for themselves. And I go, hmm, really? Did you ever read it? Because if you actually read it, you would see that it was designed for we the people. The Federalists and the Anti-Federalists that were going through the debates, uh, and it was hard times back then, the, the Anti-Federalists were the people like Thomas Jefferson and uh, uh, Patrick Henry, uh, except uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin was an Anti-Federalist. And then the Federalists were like the, uh, what's his name, Madison, et cetera, et cetera. And they wanted federal government. The anti-federalists didn't want a centralized government where the federalists wanted a centralized government. And so that went on for three years. The debates as to how and every single word in that constitution was debated over how it would, and the syntax, the apostrophes, the capitalizations, all of that were debated over a three year period. It couldn't just, it, you, once again, I say yeah. this, one person, Two people, three people can't write a constitution. Can't be done. No. <laughs> it takes the delegates to go in there and the will of the people, because you got to then turn around and give it back to the people for them to accept it. And if they won't accept it, your job is not done. You're back at the at the at the post writing again. And so these things are not easy to do. This is why it's so wonderful what you guys, what Neil's done, and what. Uh, uh, Brenda has done by allowing people to express themselves without having the confines and the handcuffs of actually having to work with the document once the architecture is put into place. Because once that architecture is put into place, now comes the tough part of creating the clauses that fit within the various jurisdictions of law that you create, that you, you've, you've bound this constitution to. You can't be creating a clause, for example, here's a quick example. Well, I think that we, sh we should be able to tax corporations 3%. Whoopsie. Now you've taken law of the land and pushed it into the water and you're bringing maritime law onto the land because now you're dealing with legal fictions. Don't forget, common law only deals with men and women. If it's a common law document, you can't have taxation, not even for corporations, period because that's the thin end of the wedge. As soon as you put any kind of taxation in there, even though you think, well, it's corporate, oh, baby ducks, they're going to come after you. And they will slide the law of the land and the water will come over it 
and we'll be back in the same position as we are today because these banksters, these polys, they are all after one thing, control. And the only way you're going to bind them is to bind them, is to not allow them to have that thin end of the wedge slip in. And so, like I was saying earlier, yes, you can have Walmart come in. Yes, they have to incorporate and no corporate personhood. So the five-year corporate charter that is issued by the government to Walmart, if they're not good corporate citizens, all their assets can be seized, including the assets of the directors and the stockholders. Yeah. So they either good corporate citizens or they're bad corporate and if they're bad corporate citizens. And so you don't you don't have you don't want to tax them, but you can delegate, like I said, 10% of their net profits go to charity in the country of Alberta. And that now they're happy to do that. Why? Because they're paying people. They 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 you you've taken out the whole accounting firm that they had to deal with. They no longer pay taxes, they no longer pay taxes deduct taxes from people's paychecks people now earn the hourly rate that they get and they go home with that the government isn't involved they're not sticking their beak in so companies big companies like that i mean you look at a company like suncor who was up on the tar sands they have probably a hundred people just in accounting that deal with the government tax crap can you imagine taking those people out? They'll find jobs elsewhere. But the, the prosperity that will come, not only to the people that work for Suncor, but that Suncor will be able to take that the monies that normally would go to the government. Now they put it into R&D and they make themselves better. That's what good corporate personhood is about. Good corporate citizenship is about. It's about investing and reinvesting in your communities so that your company grows along with your communities. And we have an opportunity to ensure that happens within our constitutions by creating those clauses that. Go ahead, Doug. That will allow that to happen. Exactly. The key difference to, to differentiate here, folks, the, the concept you have to keep in mind, corporations, people, man and woman, one set of laws, one jurisdiction. Corporations, a totally different jurisdiction. You can hold corporations fully accountable. We don't have to talk about big companies like Walmart or General Motors. How about Bob Smith and Sons Auto Wreckers? They want to do business in your town, your region, your municipality they're going to have to deal with you, not with a government entity 800 kilometers away in Winterpeg or Saskatoon. They're going to have to deal with you in the middle of Puddle Splash, Saskatchewan, okay? And believe me, there's little towns in Saskatchewan that are like four houses at a crossroad. But we got our own postal code. That's who they're going to have to deal with if they want to open an auto wreckers and run the risk of contaminating soil, watershed, not some entity in, in a big city. No, you, the people, because you, the people next door, own the land next door. You are the sovereign people. You are the government. Keep in mind... Sovereignty comes with rights, but it comes with a hell of a lot more obligations. Yeah, that word is responsibility, isn't it? That Bingo! Wonderful. So now we, the people, become responsible for who? We, the people. The people. We no longer turn to the government for assistance. You we are the government. To, we turn to our neighbors. We turn to our family, we turn to our friends, and we discuss what needs to be changed within the government. That goes back to proper education as well. I mean, if absolutely. Bingo. And why should the government be educating our children? Thank you. Why? Why? I. I. That's a point I've been wanting to make. Everybody's complaining about pull your kids out of school. 
the schools are indoctrinated. Pull your kids out. What do you mean, leave your kids in school? Go pull the friggin' teacher out of school. Go pull the source of the problem, the principal, the school board out of your school. Your kid has the right to be there. Their ideologies, philosophies, and implementation of those ideologies and philosophies are against your school standards. It's your school. Your kid goes to that school, get their ideologies and philosophies out. They work for you. Okay. Everybody mute, mute, mute their mic for a moment because I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me when I was in Vancouver. I took a small job as a substitute teacher at the Vancouver School Board. And during my tenure there, um, they were looking for volunteers to uh, do the uh, breakfast and lunch programs at the elementary schools. And uh, one of the principals at one of the elementary schools was an old friend of mine. And uh, I, I said, sure, I'll go and I'll do some volunteering. I was up in her office uh, one afternoon after, uh, after the lunch program was over. And we were chatting and she had a friend there um, who I actually didn't know at the time, but uh, I'll tell you. There was a strike going on in Vancouver, and uh, I said to her friend, who asked me very nicely, she said, well, what do you think? How, how do you think you should be, this strike should be settled? I said, well, if I'm going to pay these teachers the raises that they want, and even their base salary, I suggest that, why don't we test the kids? And if the teacher did a good job in teaching the children, um, then they get the raises. If they didn't, well boy oh boy then there's going to be hell to pay now you get you don't fire them but you don't give them a raise as a matter of fact you may take money off of their salary and let's make education valuable how do you make it valuable well if the teacher wants to earn the starting salary at that time is fifty six thousand dollars a year and have their raises every year then each each class will be tested at the end of the year. And if the class, you don't have to get 80%, uh, uh, but you know, most of the class passes the tests with good marks, the teacher gets the rate. And there'll be some sort of base anyways. So as it turned out, I did not know this, but this lady who was a friend of my friend was actually a reporter for the Vancouver province newspaper. And on the front page of the newspaper the next morning, boom, oh, my <laughs> my little conversation with her. Oh my God! The union had a hell a heyday with me. <laughs> I was called in. They couldn't fire me because I was only a substitute, but they did not hire me for another job after that. Anyway, that's my little story. You can unmute your mics now, guys. But that a lot, of, you. a lot of people are saying they feel like we've gone off topic. I see in the in the chat there. Well, we did go off topic because I I, I wanted to tell you this. It's story. my fault. I'm bad. Before that, even before that, even um, <laughs> I, we go back to uh, you know the the title of the conversation. Well, and and that's what we were talking about there um, with with how to write your write the clauses and make sure that you're locking your government in and in in, in education for example why would the government teach the children why would you not have clauses within that constitution that would allow for private individuals to and keep the government out the government might cause what you call oversight but then you're going to have to really restrict the government in a type of oversight you might want to instead set up and, and it wouldn't even it would say in the in the constitution that communities would handle education. So if you lived in one community, that community would handle a certain whatever type of education the community agreed to, rather than being dictated to from like Duke said from afar. And it it once again it 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 really comes down to once you've structured the constitution, you have the architecture for it and you've included the jurisdictions of the law, it really <coughs> comes down to the imagination of what goes in there and then how to write that 
uh, properly and consistently uh, so that it blends in to the architecture. It's like you don't build a 47 story building and, and have 10 uh, contractors who come along with 10 different types of windows and different sizes and hope that you're going to get some that fit and some that don't. Well, that's ridiculous because your building won't go up. Um, and so it really does come down to the foundations of the constitution. And then that when the clauses are created, they fit all the way through when you're, when it's done. And that, and that once again, that takes time, but it also takes more people than two or three people to write this thing. It takes all of us. Anywho, we're looking at the end of two hours here anyways, uh, Ed. I see that uh, Brenda has gone and uh, nobody, I guess everybody's ready to uh, Sunday night, 10 o'clock. Well, 10 o'clock my time, Ed's time, Duke's time. Actually, I've got a question I've been wanting to ask. I've been asked by some people, how do we write in with these environmental environmentalists? How do we keep them out of the, their noses out of things? Well, here's the thing. We know that uh, that carbon dioxide is the gas of life, and we know that uh, it's pseudoscience, and we know that if somebody was to try to slip that through and into the Constitution, that it would go to the, the will of the people. But if it did get through, um, here's the thing. Corporate personhood is probably the worst thing we could have. Corporate personhood was created in, in 1886 uh, on the uh, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railway. And it was never actually made as a decision within the within the write-up. It was actually in the head notes. And in Massachusetts, two years later, a lawyer said to the judge that corporate personhoods was settled, and he gave the uh, Santa Clara County versus uh, uh, Southern Pacific Railway as precedent. Now, the judge didn't read the case, and he agreed, which actually brought corporate personhood into existence but it's always pointed at 1886 it was actually 1888 in Massachusetts and corporate personhood made corporations persons under the law. Whoopsie. What does that mean? Well, that means they have the, exactly the same rights as all persons under the law. Now persons don't have unalienable rights because they're not men and women. They're legal fictions. But when the U S citizenship was created in 1860, 1864, 14th Amendment, that created persons. So in 1886, 1888, corporations became persons. In other words, they became U.S. citizens and had the same rights as U.S. citizens. Okay. What does that mean? Well, holy moly, it means that you can't come after them unless they've broken the law. What law? would they be breaking? They don't murder people or do they? And if they do murder people, who do you charge? You can't charge the corporation, put it in jail because it only exists on paper and in the minds of men. So this is what's got us today where we are. Corporations run the world, except they don't. It's the men that hide behind the corporations that give them limited liability that run the world. When corporate personhood, and a good example of that was in in 18, or the beginning of the 1800s, uh, the United States government issued a charter for the First Bank of the United States. And it was a 20 year charter. And in, I guess it was 1803, because in, in 1823, Andrew Jackson would not renew the charter. As a matter of fact, he said, you are a den of vipers. And basically over my dead body, would I ever give you another charter? And he ripped it up because the government had the right to do that. And that was the first bank in the United States because they were stealing people's money. And they lost all their wealth. Corporations, up until corporate personhood came through, their charters were always issued by the government. They were always given limited charters. Federal charter was 20 years, the various states and the provinces, don't forget the province, Canada and all over the world, it was globally done this way, that they could have a five-year charter, 10-year charter, 15-year charter, 20-year charter. And at the end of the tenure of the charter, the end of their five years, if they were good corporate citizens, they would have a renewal. 
but there was no limited liability. In other words, the directors of the company and the stockholders were 100% liable for any damage that corporation did. We need to bring that back. And by the way, just as a little piece of trivia, the last place in the world on planet Earth that allowed corporate personhood in was Alberta in 1930. Wouldn't it be great to have Alberta be the first country in the world that eliminates corporate personhood? Quite an interesting that. time for that to be implemented in Alberta, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah, right at the same time as the Statute of Westminster. Yeah. Right during that first 30 years of the time that Canada, the Dominion, ceased to exist. Provinces like Alberta, where people like Russell Rogers Smith were busy with the native sons of Canada during the 1920s, pushing for constitutional reform and having constitutions. Let's not forget it was out west where Louis Rial said, wait a minute, you don't have the authority. And the government came along and killed everybody until they convinced them they had the authority. Yeah, it's not surprising to see that Doug and I are the only two here from central part of the country. And this, I don't, can I use the word independence movement? This sovereignty movement, it's really moving fast and progressing well out West. And I'm not surprised by that. All we have to do is look back in the past hundred years and that's where all the, the roots, the grassroots of sovereignty has come from. It's where Walter Kuhl was from. It's where Russell Rogers Smith was from. It's where all the members of the Native Sons of Canada were from. They were all from Western, prov what we now call provinces. So it's not surprising to me to see people like you, Brenda, and John, all of you, Cody, all and all of you out there who aren't visible on this screen tonight, there's lots of you. Because I know, I can't speak for the rest of you, but I know personally, Brenda is out there. I, I've been to her home. I've met the lady. Some of you others I haven't met. I have. I can tell you people, Brenda is sincere. You heard it in her voice tonight, not her words, her voice. What you heard in her voice is in her heart. And you can feel that if you get off your butt and go do just a little bit of what Brenda's doing, you will feel that very same emotion that you heard in her voice earlier tonight. You'll feel it. Am I right, John? You feel it, don't you? When you go and talk to people, you feel that very same thing that was in her voice. So do you, Cody. I've seen you in Saskatchewan, dude, talking to people. I've seen it in your eyes. You feel that same emotion that we heard in Brenda's voice when this video first started tonight. And if anybody out there thinks you want to know what that feels like, Sit down at a Timmy's and talk to some people you've never talked to before. That's all it takes. Go make yourself uncomfortable. Yeah. Every day it feels like that, Duke. You know, and the hardest part of getting out and starting a conversation is the icebreaker question because you don't know what direction it's going. But that's a risk you need to take. And it's almost an adrenaline surge. <laughs> Looking yeah, at it's me. like throwing that first punch, right? That's right. You just don't know. You know, you know what works great for me, especially if you see a bunch of guys at the Timmy's and that sort of thing. And, and it's like, you know, this is the third time this week I've seen that group of four guys sitting there at this time of day. As you're walking out with your coffee in your hand, swing around by the fireplace, walk past them. And just as you're walking by, go, hey, guys, what if I told you Canada hasn't existed since 1931? And drop a myth is Canada business card on the table and walk away. Just do that. That's all it takes. Because if they're going to bite the bait, 
they'll spot you in two or three days. The next time you see them sitting by the fireplace, they'll see you and they'll call you over if they're going to take the bait. If they're not, well, that's okay. There'll be a group of guys at the next Tim Hortons or McDonald's or gas station. It, you're never going to know when the opportunity is going to come up. Ed Jamnasek and uh, Ryan Dunn McLean will tell you that when we were coming back from Ottawa, we stopped to get gas just outside of Shannonville, Ontario, on the 401. And while we were at the gas pumps, guys rolled up. They saw the writing on the back of my truck, but they rolled up and started talking to us. Um Ryan, Dunn Ryan will tell you, going down the highway, people that honk their horns and gives up, give us thumbs up. On the back of my truck, it's got a big Q, and it says it's not about liberal versus conservative versus NDP. It's all about Canada versus globalism. Well, you and know who people, else? yeah, people will come up and talk to you. All you got to do is break the ice. What if I told you Canada didn't really exist? You know who? You know who else's truck is all? done up is uh, a gentleman by the name of Don Morrison out in Williams Lake, British Columbia. Yep. He was, I, he was on your, your stream earlier tonight with Cody. Um, a very, very dedicated individual. I mean, my goodness. Um, it is a beautiful truck. I mean, this is, but it's all decked out with uh, kind of like your older truck, Duke. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Don. Don spent a bit of money. He, his truck looks great. He had it in an Estevan, and he's uh, he's actually added some more decals to it. I've got pictures of it, but not current pictures. But no, but he he is fearless. This man is absolutely fearless. He had uh, I met him up in uh, uh, when I was up in Ottawa with you guys, and he has a really bad P PTSD, and yet he feels the fear and does it anyway. He just gets out there. It's, and I think, and I think he thinks it's therapeutic for him. I think it's therapeutic for him, but he's absolutely fearless when it comes to talking about this with people or just, you know, he, he actually plays guitar and sings when he live streams. It's amazing. What a cool I, guy. I want to take just a second here. Since we're talking about Don Morrison, I want to share something that maybe a few people out there can relate to. Don served in the Canadian military, and when, when he first started talking to me and a few other people about Canada doesn't really exist, and, and it ended, it, the Dominion ended in 1931, and what we think of as Canada isn't really real, it's only a dream, and that we can make it real, he had a real tough time coming to grips with accepting the fact that he had served and given up years of his life in the Navy to serve a country that didn't exist. He had a real tough personal time coming to grips with that. And I know that there's a lot of other people out there. I almost called you Canadians, but Canada doesn't exist. There's a lot of other people out there who are going through that same problem. It's hard to accept that everything we've been told is a lie and what we think of as our country doesn't exist. If you're just a citizen and it's tough for you to accept that, imagine as a veteran what it was like for Don Morrison and other veterans to sit back and say, wait a minute, I went through all that shit for a country that's not even real. So yeah, I tip my hat to Don. And kudos to you, buddy. You crossed a couple of really big personal hurdles to get to where you are. And you crossed them. And if it was an Olympic hurdle race, buddy, you'd be going home with a gold medal because you crossed every hurdle cleared it easily okay ladies and gentlemen um thank you very much for that dude don don truly is a really great guy um i think we're gonna we're gonna tie it up here for this evening and uh i'd like to thank uh, all the all the participants um uh cody holler john uh Mahalich, brenda statner neil laguda and yes he was a late comer but well worth it uh, 
new books. And I want to thank I'd like Ed Jamnesa for being the moderator of this again. Go ahead, Brenda. Please do. I was just going to say I'd like to thank you and and um, Ed for hosting this, and um, it was a really um, enlightening conversation. Thank you very much. I'd like. I to just want to say kudos to in. Brenda. I love you, woman. You're doing a great job. I'm out of here, folks. I'm going to go stretch my legs. I've been in this chair all day. Thank you, Doug, for having me on. Good night, everybody. See you, Cody, Neil, John, Brenda. Bye, folks. Good night, Duke. Thanks, Ed. Night, Duke. Night, Duke. Go ahead, Cody. Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. I mean, as much as I'm grateful for for everybody who's helping make these roundtables happen, um, this is not going to amount to anything without the audience and the people. And uh, you guys are the most important resource out there. Spread the word. Uh, like we said, strike up conversations. Do whatever you can. Get the word out there because it's going to come down to all of us working together to push this to make something great for our future. Absolutely. Neil, would you like to say any last things to the audience tonight? No, it was a good show. Uh, hopefully I can get into more of these with you guys. and we can. Well, I appreciate you coming. This is the first one that you and I have done uh, since I've known you. And I appreciate your input tonight, Neil. Thank you very much. And I know the audience appreciates your input. And yes, we will be doing more of these together. I can assure you. John, would you like to say anything? I sure would. Merry Christmas, everyone. And thank you so much for coming. Um, I see our numbers are growing, especially with the YouTube channel. I don't know what it is on Facebook because, of course, I got punted off there. But it's good to see that People are getting involved. Now we need some active participants. By participating, that could only mean you attend one of these. You attend a constitutional convention committee. You maybe volunteer to set up some chairs. Maybe you can volunteer 10 bucks for coffee, et cetera, et cetera. Every little bit helps. We all got to give it our all to try and accomplish this. And we're all, I mean, I love the people of the East just as much as I love the people of the West. There's uh Why don't you, is Jack still up? Would you like to bring him on and, and, and have him say goodnight to the people for you, please? No, he's in bed, actually. <laughs> is he in bed? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Dude, Ow. It's good. We're done. Okay. But, yeah, thanks very much for having me, Ed, Doug, and uh, we'll be talking to you guys soon. Well, and ladies and gentlemen, this is the last roundtable um, I'll be hosting this year. Um, we will be coming back in the new year uh, with some more topics and uh, more people. Um, and so please uh, stay, stay tuned in and start getting active. Uh, start reaching out to some of the people that you've seen on these roundtables. Um, they're active. They're looking for people to work with them. Uh, to do this. And the only way that we, the people, can make the change is to actually do that stuff. But thank you very much, all of you, for showing up. And for those that come time and time again and support us, I so appreciate this. And I know that everybody does that I'm working with uh, as well. And uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Until next time, thank you very much. And thanks again, Ed. As per usual, it's been wonderful. <laughs>